Good morning and welcome to today's webinar. We are so pleased that so many of you have joined us. As a reminder, this event is not a press event and the webinar is being recorded. For specific questions about the discussion, please use the Q&A icon at the bottom of the toolbar. And now let's begin today's webinar. Well, good day, everyone. It's certainly uh, my honor to be addressing you all uh, today. Uh, I think we are, we have a lot of good conversation in store um, with the panelists uh, or speakers uh, that have joined. Um, so I'll get right to it. I mean, first of all, I think everyone recognizes uh, the anniversary uh, that we just uh, acknowledge this month uh, on June 5th, uh, understanding that it's been 40 years since our CDC officially reported the first a uh, handful of cases, five cases of those affected by what later became known as uh, AIDS. And we think it's important that we uh, continue um, to uh, truly lift up those lives that have been lost or those lives that continue to live on uh, with, with AIDS uh, or HIV, especially in light of the fact that we are still uh, very much uh, trying to reach the finish line with regards to this epidemic. We know that there have been 32 million people, even more than that, um, around the world that have succumbed to this disease, including over 700,000 um, that have lost their lives here in the U.S. And at the same time, um, we're hopeful about the progress we continue to make uh, and some key milestones that we can celebrate. I know just in the past week, we all convened, albeit virtually, uh, around the UN high-level meeting on HIV AIDS. We also uh, have been able to celebrate uh, the new UN AIDS global strategy, which was really shepherded by the fierce Winnie Bianima and appreciate her leadership in that regard. And then finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't welcome our new director of the White House Office of National AIDS policy, who you'll get to hear from a little bit later. But I think my job here is just to help reiterate the U.S.'s commitment uh, to ending AIDS. Last week, we did come together with over 190 countries to pass the U.N. Political De Declaration on HIV AIDS. And we also have supported uh, that U.N. AIDS global strategy that I've mentioned. In addition, President Biden has spoken about the importance of us not letting our foot off the gas. And again, we know that we've made considerable progress and that is important to highlight. And yet he has said to achieve equitable access to prevention, care, and treatment in every community, particularly for communities of color and the LGBTQ plus community, we have to really uh, do more work around human rights, stigma, and discrimination in particular. He also talked about the moral leadership that the U.S. must embody in this regard uh, and in service to those living with HIV. And so it's our hope that we can demonstrate that um, not just through words that we'll offer today regarding our own plans and strategy, but through clear actions that we hope to take uh, from this point forward. I also recognize that this is not just about an international or domestic response, but a global one, HIV, and AIDS are, are issues that are addressed uh, worldwide or that are, need to be priorities worldwide. And of course, we have expressed our commitment to ending AIDS at home and abroad equally. And so I'm glad that we are able to hear from experts and advocates in this space who can share their robust knowledge and experience in a way that will help us learn from uh, Atlanta to Nairobi, right? And there's a lot that we can do uh, to really connect these dots and ensure that we are, again, demonstrating and communicating that we truly are all in this together. So with that, I'm really glad that we're all convening to recommit, re-energize, and re-engage uh, in our work to end the HIV epidemic and also confront um, what is now being faced by each of us in this space uh, with regards to COVID-19 and how that has very much affected our work. I thank each of you for being here with us today. Again, I'm looking forward 
to the discussion we're able to have. And I think next I have the pleasure and honor of introducing my boss, the U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services, Mr. Javier Becerra. On June 5th, 1981, the CDC reported the first five cases of what we now know as AIDS. Today, we honor the more than 32 million people globally who have died of AIDS-related illness, including 700,000 here in the U.S. And in their memory, and standing alongside the HIV community, we recommit ourselves to the work that must be completed to end the HIV epidemic. We recommit to re-energizing a whole of society effort towards this end. And we recommit to re-engaging all sectors of American and global society in order to meet this objective. Right now, 38 million people, including 1.2 million here in the U.S., are living with HIV. And 40 years on, we still don't have a cure. But we have made tremendous progress since 1981 with advances in HIV testing, research, prevention, care, and treatment. The U.S. government is deeply committed to ending the HIV epidemic once and for all. And in the 40 years since that CDC report, we know that we now have the tools to accomplish that goal. Landmark biomedical and scientific research advances have led to the development of many successful HIV treatment regimens, prevention strategies, and improved care for people living with HIV. Thanks to pre-exposure prophylaxis, PrEP, post-exposure prophylaxis, PEP, and syringe services programs, an individual's risk of acquiring HIV is significantly lower today than ever before. Since the mid-1980s, when at its peak, 130,000 individuals were infected with HIV annually. National HIV prevention and care efforts have dropped that number to less than 35,000 in 2019. And we are making additional progress that we know will bring us even closer to ending the HIV epidemic. New data from the CDC shows that we have made significant improvements in the number of people prescribed PrEP and in viral suppression rates. For example, in 2019, nearly 23% of people eligible for PrEP were prescribed it, up from 3% in 2015. Together, we will continue our whole of society approach and we will engage populations which bear most of the HIV burden, including gay and bisexual men, blacks and Latinos, transgender women, and those living in the Southern US. Domestically, we'll continue implementing our initiative, ending the HIV epidemic in the US, which aims to reduce the number of new HIV infections in the United States by at least 90% by 2030. And through PEPFAR, the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief, which has saved more than 20 million lives, we will continue to contribute to ending the HIV epidemic worldwide. We have made remarkable progress in preventing and treating HIV in the US and around the world. And it has been built on the shoulders of the early pioneers of the modern AIDS movement, who gave their hearts, their souls, and many of them their lives so that we end the HIV epidemic. Together, we also honor the resilience and diversity of those living with HIV and the HIV service community, which makes a world of difference. But the work is not finished. HIV related stigma remains a significant barrier and the COVID-19 pandemic has slowed and threatened hard won gains. I'm excited to engage with members of the Biden-Harris administration and with leaders across society to take steps necessary to end the HIV epidemic. Thank you. Well, thank you. And regards to Secretary Becerra for those additional opening remarks. I would now like to introduce Dr. Tim Harrison, who joins us from the Office of Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policy at our Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, Tim is the Deputy Director for Strategic, Strategic Initiatives, excuse me, as well as a senior policy advisor. So Tim, over to you. Thank you so much, Lois. I am very happy to be here and to be able to introduce our next speakers and lend my voice to this important commemoration of the 40th anniversary of HIV. Um, I want to begin by introducing Jen Cates. Uh, Jen Cates is the Senior Vice President and Director of Global Health and HIV Policy at Kaiser Family Foundation and a longtime global and domestic HIV expert and advocate. And I'm also very excited to introduce my colleague and friend Harold Phillips, who for the first time on January 5th was announced in his new role from Ambassador Susan Rice as with his appointment to the Director of Office of National AIDS Policy at the White House. 
Jen and Harold will be having a conversation about the state of the domestic HIV epidemic and where we should be focusing our efforts. But first, I'd like to ask Jen, as a longtime advocate, to reflect on where we are at this point in time in our efforts to end the HIV epidemic at home and abroad. Thank you so much, Tim. And hi, everyone. It's really an honor to be here today, be part of this, and to be with so many um, experts and leaders who I admire and actually have known, and, and we're all part of a community, which often happens when you're um, fighting against something that's um, formidable. I'm especially glad that we're here to talk about the connections and, and looking at the domestic and the global epidemics together. Uh, we don't, not, many of us don't see them as distinct. They're often talked about that way. Um, this acknowledgement of 40 years is occurring at a time that I think most of us could not have easily foreseen. We are still 40 years later combating a previously unknown virus that took the world by surprise in 1981. We've made tremendous gains as we've already started to hear about, but certainly not enough. And there's still so much more to be done. And now of course, we're in the midst of look, uh, experiencing the impact of another previously unknown type of, in this case, coronavirus, which has upended almost everything around the world. Both have altered how we think about health and society and the determinants of health outcomes. With the response to HIV, I think in many ways setting the stage for our, this understanding. In fact, as we know, the HIV response has in so many ways helped to inform how we need to respond to COVID-19. Within this larger context in the US, the political and policy landscape has dramatically shifted in just the past few months. The new administration has moved quickly to reset the role of the US in the world, most immediately related to COVID, but not just because of COVID. The administration has also taken a decidedly different approach to healthcare and access in the US, moving to protect the ACA, to reestablish protections based on sexual orientation and gender identity and protections for non-citizens, and has placed a main emphasis on equity, all of which have tremendous implications for the fight against HIV. The budget request that was released uh, just last month um, builds upon past efforts to address the domestic HIV response, including the ending the HIV epidemic initiative. The EHE would get a boost to 670 million or 66% increase above current levels if enacted. And this would be the biggest increase for the initiative to date. The request for PEPFAR would keep the program at um, level funding, but would mark the first time in four years where there was not a proposal to significantly cut PEPFAR. So the landscape that we're, we're, we're in is quite different from even just a few months ago. Although one through line I think is important for all of us to acknowledge is that there, within all of the challenges that have been there, there's been a tremendous bipartisan commitment to fight HIV, both domestically and globally. Um, and that maybe still sets it apart from, from many things. So with that, I want to turn to, um, to Harold Phillips and just to, um, join in with everyone said, congratulations. We're really, really excited that you're there. Um, I know it's only been seven days. Uh, it's probably seemed longer than that, but I'm hoping you can uh, already start by providing um, uh, an overview of what you see as the top priorities for moving aggressively, particularly on the equity front for HIV programs in the US, especially to address black and Latino communities and those living in the southern part of the U.S. Hi, Jen, and hello, everyone, and thanks again for the congratulations. You're right, it's only day seven, uh, but as uh, President Biden said, uh, as part of his budget, he still wants us to move aggressively and, and boldly to work toward the end of the HIV epidemic, and as you indicated, some of the, uh, the budget requests sort of reflects those priorities as well. But in ending HIV, I think it's important, and many of us uh, that are here today also know this, that it's not just a medical issue, that we're not just going to end the HIV epidemic by focusing on the very important work that HHS do does through its programs, both whether it be CDC, HRSA, SAMHSA, NIH, the work that IHS is doing as well. In order to have a response to the HIV epidemic that is both equitable, we need a cross-government approach. We need input from the departments and the other programs that often work to address social determinants of health 
uh, and also those programs, we need to ensure that, as we are throughout uh, the Biden-Harris administration, ensuring that there is an equitable, equitable approach that places Black, Brown, and Indigenous people at the center of those responses. And as part of that, part of the work of ONAP will also be to ensure that there's an, an HIV response and that the needs of people living with HIV are addressed through some of these, these programs. So it's gonna call for new partnerships, I think, potentially new programs, but also an increased focus on the need to address HIV, not just as a medical issue, but also a social justice issue. Thanks. Thanks. Um, picking up on that, um, you mentioned the sort of need to look broadly. It's not just government, it's really across a society. Can you talk a little bit more specifically about um, are, there, are there sectors that need to be further engaged or re-engaged or certain populations that really um, need to, to be brought into the response more directly? Sure. And, and this is some of the work that, you know, I started uh, as chief operating officer when I was in OASH in the Office of Infectious Disease and HIV Policy. That whole of society approach, uh, thinking about sort of faith based organizations, you know, when we're talking about the need to address the the basic needs that individuals and families have, whether it be food insecurity or transportation or housing. Some of our faith-based organizations, especially those that are affirming and accepting, are doing some of that work. Um, and so really, I think creating partnerships and the opportunity to sort of expand that work within the HIV space. I think there are other sectors of the healthcare workforce that we haven't completely and fully engaged. In the last year, we did a lot of work to engage with pharmacists, given that the uh, most Americans live within a five mile radius of a pharmacy and a pharmacist and thinking about what role pharmacists can play in, in both PrEP HIV testing, as well as it counseling and adherence and helping individuals stay in care, as well as in some places, pharmacists are doing work to connect individuals to other community services. So I think that kind of innovative thinking and approach and creating those new partnerships. Are there partnerships in many of our communities where we can be working with the uh, environmental and justice community? When we think about sort of, I've seen recently an overlay of a map that looked at sort of natural and man-made hazards in communities, and it looked very much like our EHE communities in terms of uh, the prevalence. So I think there are new partnerships, especially as we think about equity and improving population health that can be uh, brought to our HIV response where we have mutually beneficial goals. Thank you. Yes, I think we've we've really learned so much about how we have to think about our approach to HIV, but so many things as vulnerable communities and who are those communities that we have to reach. So specific policy issues, what and and areas that advocates should be looking at, that federal, state, and local health officials and pub, other public health officials should be focusing on, or if there are a few key policies you would highlight that we should think about. So again, day seven, but also uh, one of the things that we, we are going to do, because the administration has been clear on this, uh, is a, a revising of the National HIV AIDS Strategic Plan. And so uh, working to, and as part of that, thinking about this cross-departmental, cross-program approach with the federal government, but also how do we engage different sectors of society. I think also thinking about what else can be done uh, to address the issues of HIV criminalization in our country, which creates great barriers along the continuum, uh, especially when it comes to HIV testing. Uh, I think also HIV criminalization also gets in the way of our ability to come together both as community and the federal government and think about and uh, unpack some of the issues that are related to the use of molecular surveillance. So I think those are some areas that we definitely will be delving into and trying to figure out a different approach. Thanks, and this is my last question. Um, it's hard to read this, but we're you know entering the fifth decade. I think we all know that, but just the enormity of hearing that, um, of dealing with HIV in the US and around the world. What gives you hope at this juncture that we can end this? I think, um, what gives me hope is 
the dialogue I think that we've been having over the last year about the role of systemic racism in all of this, uh, as well as uh, a realization that, yes, we can do something about stigma. I think some of this we've learned from some of our global and international partners about ways to sort of measure stigma, stigma interventions that could be implemented, and the fact and recognition that stigma is real, tangible, and impacts at health outcomes. Uh, so I think as we sort of really get at some of these root causes, which are very often rooted in stigma and discrimination, and think about a more equitable approach, it gives me hope. Thank you. And thanks and congratulations again, Harold. We're really very excited and fortunate um, to have you there. So I'd now like to welcome into the uh, video uh, Dr. Anjali Ashraker who is the acting U.S. Global AIDS Coordinator and Special Representative for Global Health for the U.S. President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, PEPFAR. Thank you, Anjali, not just for doing what you do every day, but for really um, overseeing PEPFAR during an incredibly challenging time um, when COVID was, you know, has been wreaking havoc around the world. And PEPFAR is, in many of the countries it works, the largest supporter and lifeline for people with and at risk for HIV. So very challenging and thank you so much for, for being there. Um, before I get into a few questions similar to Harold, can you provide your initial top line thoughts on what you see as the main priorities now for moving forward in the global fight against HIV um, with PEPFAR's uh, focus? Sure, thanks very much, Jen. And it really is so great to be here with you and, and friends and colleagues across the USG as well as across the AIDS community. So uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. But before I begin, I do also wanna add to your congratulations of, of Harold. Harold, we're thrilled uh, 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 to have you in this, in this new role, even though it is just only day seven, but we really can't imagine uh, a better person and a better partner uh, to continue in this vital vital space. And, and we have um, in recent years worked closely together, Harold, on, on sharing lessons and applying lessons from the global space to the domestic space and vice versa. And um, I know we can continue to, to work on that front. So again, just really, really grateful to have you in this, in this role. Um, Jen, to your question about, um, about priorities, you know, it really is a pivotal mo moment in the AIDS response, uh, both in the U.S., as, as you and Harold were discussing, uh, but also around the world, uh, particularly uh, as we're confronted with these dual pandemics um, that, are, that are occurring simultaneously. You know, it's hard to believe that 40 years ago we would still be in this place where you know, AIDS is still with us. It's taken over 32 million lives. Uh, as, as Lois noted earlier, um, you know, but, but we also, in, in honoring uh, those 32 million lost, we also celebrate those that are alive and thriving um, with HIV. And, um, you know, we, we work every day to make sure that we can continue uh, the life-saving services that, that they require. I just I, I can't talk about the priorities without just acknowledging the incredible bipartisan support that we have enjoyed um, truly uh, since the outset of, of PEPFAR in 2003. We have um, really been so um, blessed to have tremendous bipartisan support across now four presidential administrations, 10 Congresses. Um, you know, American people through PEPFAR have invested over $85 billion in the global AIDS response. That's through PEPFAR, as well as through our contributions to the Global Fund to Fight, H to fight uh, AIDS, Malaria, and TB. So it's tremendous. And with that, as Secretary Becerra noted in his video, PEPFAR has saved over 20 million lives, prevented millions of HIV infections around the globe. So it's, it's extraordinary. Um, Secretary Blinken announced last week during the high-level meeting uh, that PEPFAR is now supporting over 18.2 million people on treatment, on life-saving ARVs. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary. As far as our top priorities, you know, we have to finish what we started. We've got to finish the fight. I think first, achieving and maintaining epidemic control. Several of the PEPFAR-supported countries have reached HIV epidemic control, which is extraordinary. Um, and many others are on pace to get there. 
So, so really, as we've as we've been confronting COVID nineteen, just ensuring that those countries continue to move forward is going to be critical. Second um, is investing in people that are at greatest risk. You know that in PEPFAR we really analyze and scrutinize very granular data disaggregated by age, by sex, by population, by ge geography, and then target our investments to where the greatest needs and where the greatest gaps are. It really is about ensuring that we are working to pro provide services to those that need them most. And part of this is really ending the inequities that continue to impede our progress, the laws, the policies, the, the other practices that, that Harold noted are, are, are same for us globally, um, to really make sure that we are addressing the needs for LGBTQI plus uh, populations, people who um, inject drugs, sex workers, prisoners, women and girls, you know, so we're really working to advance um, their needs. And third and finally is ensuring people-centered services. This is something that we've been focusing on um, through PEPFAR, but COVID-19 has made it even abundantly uh, more apparent how critical it is to put people at the center and make sure that our programming is, is addressing their very specific needs, where they're at, um, to ensure that we can provide uh, lifelong services. Thanks, um, thank you for that. It's truly amazing when you think about 18 million people being on treatment today. When PEFAR started, it was I think less than 50,000 in the hardest hit places. So it's it's kind of amazing um, to, to fathom. You mentioned the high level meeting and Lois had also mentioned it. Can you just give us some highlights from that? What It was a very important stage for the US. Um, there was a lot uh, to be discussed that, that um, you know, to, to to move forward, what were some of the highlights? Sure, you know, it was it was pretty extraordinary to even just go into the UN high level meeting last week uh, with such incredible support from across mm -hmm. the US government. Um, really last week was, was nothing short of extraordinary. Um, it's, it's not every day that you have first the president of the United States, the vice president, the secretary of state, the secretary of health and human services, heads of agencies, reaffirm our commitment uh, to HIV, both domestically and globally. So those statements at the outset um, were so powerful. And then days later, having Secretary of State Blinken lead our U.S. delegation that, that was comprised of not only U.S. government officials, but, but civil society and community was a part of our delegation as well, participating in the U.N. high-level meeting. Um, Secretary Blinken delivered a powerful statement about the tremendous progress we've made and the need to tackle enduring inequities that stand in our way. Um, it, was, it was really unprecedented, um, not just in the statement that he made, but also in the deliberations that occurred throughout the week, um, several weeks, I should say, but, but in particular related to the political declaration. The U.S. delivered a really powerful uh, statement on the floor of the General Assembly, Assembly laying out in clearest terms um, that we stand unequivocally with people living with and affected by HIV and for the policies and programs um, that are essential to meet their needs. So, you know, as Lois noted, there were, we're, we're very proud of the global AIDS strategy um, that was that we also adopted in um, March. But to have a political declaration where the U.S. was standing firmly um, with and for the people we serve um, was really powerful. I think just Finally, for me, the high level meeting drove home the fact that unless we confront these inequities in our communities, in the countries where we work, our progress on AIDS will slow, stall, or even reverse course. And, and this is something that we have to, again, just double down on uh, to make sure we're, we're moving forward. We have to be clear eyed about the opportunities and challenges ahead. Um, we're closer than ever to ending AIDS, but some of our hardest and most important work is in front of us. Thanks, and speaking of some of that hard work, um, could you just say a little bit about, you know, COVID-19 has had a, a threatened the work of PEPFAR and other, the HIV response more broadly. Um, can you talk about how you've been working uh, with countries and with other international partners to mitigate that impact and what kinds of things are still need to be done? Sure, thanks. Thanks, Jen. You know, COVID-19 has challenged us uh, for the past several, several months and continues to challenge us globally. Um, 
as President Biden, you know, continually stresses, you know, we must turn that challenge into an opportunity to build back better. And I, and I feel like that is what we've been doing together in partnership with the Global Fund, in partnership with communities, in partnership with local partners implementing services, and a really strong and robust uh, U.S. government team across the globe. Um, you know, at the outset of COVID-19 um, in early 2020, PEPFAR, we were firmly focused on just ensuring that we were protecting the gains that we had made. It was really how do we ensure that we don't lose any of the gains that, that, that we had made. Um, and like I said, some really important adaptations had been made to the program. And we are now, you know, a million, we've added an additional million people to treatment in some very difficult times. But what we've done recently is really move to pr from protecting our gains to accelerating our progress um, through innovative adaptations um, and, and person-centered services that we've learned um, that are actually really critical that we need to institutionalize in the program. For example, um, you know, multi-month dispensing of um, of, of ART and decentralized drug delivery closest to the community um, or where people live in the community has been critical. These are things that you know we've talked about for many, many years, frankly, but it wasn't until COVID-19 that we were able to shift and implement with governments that quickly. For example, the absolute number of clients on multi-month dispensing nearly doubled from 4.8 million to 8.3 million last year alone. So that's just extraordinary. Um, again, we're, we're continuing to learn and apply some of these adaptations to other parts of the program. So multi-month dispensing for PrEP delivery, um, community delivery of PrEP. Um, these are things that we're exploring and, and implementing because it, it is working and it, it is meeting um, uh, clients' needs. Thank you. So my last question for you is the same one that I asked Harold. Um, at this juncture, going into our fifth decade of this uh, epidemic, the HIV epidemic, what does give you hope that we can end this? You know, despite the challenges that we face, many of which have been exacerbated as we've talked about uh, by COVID-19, I remain not only hopeful, but deeply optimistic that we can and will end uh, the HIV epidemic. There are many reasons for this, but there are two in particular that I wanna to emphasize today. First, um, Dr. Fauci talks about this all the time. You know, we, we have a remarkable set of scientific tools to fight the epidemic, and we have real world proof that when these tools are applied correctly and at scale, people living with HIV can lead healthy lives. We can get to epidemic control. So it is working. Um, the second, and perhaps the most important is the HIV community is a force of nature unlike any other. We never give up, even in the face of extreme adversity, we demand accountability of ourselves and others, and we refuse to leave anyone behind, always putting people we serve at the forefront of our, of our efforts. So, you know, I think we have what it takes to complete this journey. One started by the courageous advocates who marched in the streets across across America and in countries around the world, we can end H the HIV epidemic for everyone everywhere. And I, I really do believe um, we can do this together. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, and now um, I'd like to turn and introduce, turn to and introduce Greg Millett, who will join us on the screen. Um, Greg is Vice President and Director of Public Policy at AMFAR. He's a nationally recognized epidemiologist and researcher who's changed the way we think about health disparities among black gay men. And over the past year, he's been a leading voice pointing out similarities between COVID-19 and HIV and the disproportionate impact on communities of color. And I also wanna say he's someone I can proudly call my friend since the 1980s in college when we were both just barely becoming aware of the role HIV would play in both our lives. Thank you, Greg, and I'm gonna turn it over to you. 
Thank you, Jen. Uh, it's really wonderful being here today. It's wonderful um, to have an opportunity to speak with so many friends and colleagues. Um, Harold, we are so happy that you are at the White House and you're gonna continue to do the great work that needs to get done to get us to ending the HIV epidemic. And what I'm tasked with today is to talk about how HIV has changed the world um, within the 40 years of progress that we've made. And you know, before I begin, I just wanna start with a quote from um, William Faulkner about the past is never dead, it's not even past, uh, because we really do have to take a look at what happened in the past with the HIV um, and how we repeated that past in some ways for COVID-19. Um, now, many of you might remember uh, last year at the very beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, when it was really hitting Italy before it came to the United States, um, that there was a video of a town in Italy where the obituaries went on for more than 10 or 12 pages of people who passed away from COVID-19. And I remember speaking with friends um, about the 1980s and how we were all having this PTSD um, about exactly the same things that we remember seeing in the 1980s uh, for HIV with you know newspapers and gay newspapers filled with obituaries of friends and colleagues um, who are no longer there. The other similarities that we see is the stigma that um, is associated with infectious disease. In the 1980s, we had the four H's, hemophiliacs, Haitians, homosexuals, and heroin users. And then unfortunately, stigma reared its ugly head again um, in the late 90s with the down low phenomenon here in the United States um, and stigma against bisexually active men. And then unfortunately, that HIV stigma persists. Um, we've seen with Charlie Sheen coming out uh, just recently um, that um, he was basically being extorted uh, by his girlfriend to keep his HIV status secret. So this stigma is something that's enduring. Um, and we unfortunately see the same stigma that's taken place um, during COVID-19 uh, with discrimination and waves of attacks that are being leveled against Asian communities, Asian American communities, Black and Latinos um, who have been saying that they've been experiencing COVID-related stigma, Latino workers, particularly um, in meat plants um, who've um, received uh, uh, stigma and discrimination from surrounding towns and communities because of fear of COVID-19. The other thing that we see that is similar with HIV is we have been fairly late to recognize the differences by sex. So with HIV, remember it wasn't until 1993 uh, that we reclassified our um, definition of HIV infection and expanded it to include women. Uh, because up until that time, um, it was not necessarily recognized that this was a condition that also affected women um, and not just men. And unfortunately, we repeated that as well with COVID-19, where at the very beginning of the pandemic, we kept talking and asking, why are men more vulnerable for COVID-19 than women? Um, and when unfortunately, the thing that we didn't realize is that the COVID-19 recession disproportionately hit women compared to men. Um, and that we see now that there was also a pandemic within a pandemic with intimate partner violence increasing during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, as well as the fact that some of the worst side effects that we see for COVID-19 vaccines are reported primarily among women. So we were late for the recognition of some of the differences by sex for both of these epidemics. The other thing that we've seen with both of these epidemics is the degree to which they have affected marginalized po populations and particularly communities of color. Uh, my colleagues and I published um, a very early paper showing the nationwide impact of COVID-19 um, in Black communities where we found that in those counties, as the number of Black residents increased, you saw an increase in COVID-19 cases as well as deaths, and eventually found that among those counties, only 20% of counties, that nearly 52% um, uh, of them had the nation's COVID-19 cases and nearly 60% of um, the nation's COVID deaths. And unfortunately, it's something that is enduring. There are data that CDC released, uh, again, looking at some of these disproportionately Black, Latino, or Native American counties, where they found that for large stretches of the pandemic that we saw greater rates of COVID-19 new infections taking place in Black counties and Latino counties, as well as Asian counties, um, compared to all other counties in the US. Um, and that was been one of the really sobering parts of the COVID-19 pandemic is the degree to which we've seen that the populations, particularly by race and ethnicity, who are disproportionately impacted by HIV are the same populations that were disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 in terms of cases, hospitalizations, as well as deaths. 
We also see the impact in terms of aging. You know, we've had the benefit of ART and for people living with HIV to live longer, more fruitful lives with more than half of us in the United States who are HIV positive over the age of 50. Uh, but unfortunately, COVID-19 really aimed at cutting down those individuals who are elderly in our society, uh, where we also saw, again, some of these disproportionate rates among Black and Latino communities uh, who are elderly, who are cut down by COVID-19. And we certainly have seen friends and colleagues people living with HIV um, who passed away in the last year, such as Barbara Joseph, Dolores Dockery, as well as Ed Shaw, and many others that many of us know. So with that said, there still is a lot for us to celebrate. There's been a lot of progress that has lifted all boats with HIV. I mean, the first thing that we could talk about is the science and the role that the NIH has played in really advancing HIV science to a point uh, where we really are, are, can address most opportunic, opportunistic infections, antiretroviral therapies are available um, to make sure that people living with HIV live long, productive, happy lives, um, and that we have pre-exposure prophylaxis to prevent um, HIV infection. And just here on the side, you can see this from this slide from 1990 through 2016, that worldwide there's just been this precipitous decline in HIV AIDS deaths because of the advent of antiretroviral therapy. And you can see uh, the number of deaths that have been averted because of the advent of antiretroviral therapy and making sure that it's available across the world and not just in the United States. And within the US, you can also see that among people living with HIV, and these are data that CDC released last year, that we've seen a decrease in deaths among people living with HIV. Um, and this decrease in deaths are HIV-related deaths, as you can see from this line here. It's not all-cause mortality, it's HIV-related deaths. So we have been making some incredible headway. And that headway has also lifted the boats for many other diseases. Of course, HIV science has been instrumental in creating the COVID-19 vaccines, um, our Ebola vaccines, the Hep C DAAs. Um, we just found out data that NRTIs um, have been instrumental in treating macular degeneration. Um, and then, of course, the HIV science has really revolutionized rapid tests. It's revolutionized self-testing, as well as online interventions and apps for people for across various diseases. The other thing that we see between COVID-19 and HIV um, is the way that clinicians were on the front line. So particularly for HIV, we saw that, you know, there was compassion in the face of fear, that these clinicians uh, really took care of people living with HIV despite the panic that was enveloping um, the United States and the fear of touching or being close to someone with HIV. Um, we saw something that was very similar uh, with um, COVID-19. Not only were HIV doctors leading the charge uh, for COVID-19, but clinicians also all across the United States um, worked incredibly long hours uh, to, in the worst of the pandemic, to address COVID-19, uh, where they showed compassion uh, by using their cell phones to say goodbye to family members uh, with patients um, who are bedbound, um, and also um, humanizing themselves by showing their faces um, as part of their gear, that protective gear um, would not allow patients to see. Um, and we also know that Clinicians also have a toll in the COVID-19 fight with about 4,000 um, who passed away from COVID-19 in the US alone. The other lesson that we have is the power of community. And this has been brought up several times today um, and how fearless and how incredible the HIV community has been. The HIV community fundamentally defined a community response uh, by issuing person first language that we're not victims, we're not uh, victims of HIV, that, that people are empowered um, in their response to HIV. And a lot of that was encapsulated in the Denver principles. Um, the creation of legal services um, by people living with HIV for people living with HIV, a buddy system uh, for people living with HIV, food banks, speaker bureaus. It was this whole system that really defined a community response. We also transformed provider patient relationships with patients fundamentally in the driver's seat. Up until that time, that has never happened um, in the US medical system. And then of course, there was the activism that had done so much to make visible the invisible, what was taking place, the devastation that was taking place uh, of HIV, both domestically as well as globally, with quicker approval of drugs, um, increased funding for research. And David French saying that ACT UP created a model for patient advocacy within the 
in the research system that never existed before. And we're seeing some of this as well taking place with COVID-19 and emulated by COVID-19 with Survivor Corps, uh, which is the largest online service for people living with COVID-19 or had COVID-19 and still suffering from systems that provides a panoply of services for those individuals. And we also see how individuals, you know, really stepped up to the plate and were able to make sure that HIV vaccine websites were navigable for most people um, across the US by fixing some of the sites in New York or in Massachusetts or other places so that make it easier for people to find an, uh, a COVID-19 vaccine. The other way that we see that the community response has been instrumental is even in providing solutions and interventions. Um, we know that needle exchange is a solution that came from the community and this enduring solution has been helpful in so many different outbreaks that have taken place in the United States, including the Scott County outbreak, uh, where more than 200 people became inf uh, infected with, uh, with um, HIV as well as co-infected with hepatitis C. But as soon as the syringe services program was instituted, you saw that there was a leveling off of the infections and a eventually no infections that took place. So again, this community response and this innovation from the community has been incredibly effective. It was also the community that recognized that these are overlapping issues and problems that we have to deal with. It's not just HIV, but it is um, substance use and overdoses, it's hepatitis C. And now of course we see COVID-19 and we've seen how that recognition of these overlapping epidemics um, have taken place during the COVID-19 pandemic with CDC issuing data that there have been increases in opioid and overdose um, de deaths over the last year, um, specifically for opioids, for methamphetamines, as well as for cocaine, all of which are associated uh, with HIV infection as well. And that there's also been spikes in congenital syphilis, um, particularly in our area, but in other places across the country as well, that's taken place during the COVID-19 pandemic. So there was this recognition that we've had um, in the HIV community that it's not just HIV alone, um, that it is different other diseases um, that coexist and um, also uh, make matters worse uh, for people living with HIV and people who are living with other chronic or other um, health conditions. There's also this recognition of the comprehensiveness of the HIV response and how important that's been in us really achieving some of the remarkable changes that we've been able to achieve. Um, it's not just the individual level interventions that have been helpful. It's marrying the individual level interventions with systemic interventions such as housing, childcare, transportation, legal services, as well as some of the policy remedies to really get us to where we've been um, in addressing HIV in the United States. And we could see how a lot of that has been in display even in the Ryan White program. Uh, with the provision of wraparound services and how that has affected viral suppression for various communities in the United States, for Latinos, men who are sex with men, people who inject drugs, African-Americans, transgender youth, people who are unstably housed, where we've seen this increase in viral suppression from 2010 through 2019. We also see in the Veterans Administration with a premium being placed on health equity uh, that the COVID-19 response was fundamentally different than what we saw throughout the rest of the United States. Uh, that in the VA, um, that even though African Americans as well as Latinos were far more likely to get COVID-19, that they were not more likely to die from COVID-19, as we saw nationally, that health equity really helped, as well as the VA and its response to HIV, where we've seen consistently higher performance across the HIV care continuum compared to national samples. The other thing that we see that is very much similar to HIV as well is, you know, after HIV, it just garnered so many of us who uh, were essentially deputized to become involved in the HIV response. I certainly became involved in the HIV response after living in Brooklyn, New York and watching so many people around me who were dying and my father working at St. Vincent's Hospital, uh, which was ground zero for HIV. And that's why I became interested in public health. We're seeing the same thing right now with COVID-19, with public health programs, seeing a surge in students right after the pandemic, as well as medical schools that are seeing a surge in applications, particularly from Blacks and Latinos who are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 and just gives us hope that we're going to see a new generation of health leaders. And then, as has been mentioned before, we know that what's been incredibly helpful for HIV is that it has been bipartisan for most of the pandemic, uh, with um, President Biden committing more money for um, ending the HIV AIDS epidemic program domestically. Um, it's a program that was started by President Trump um, that also began within communities first. Um, President Obama's national HIV AIDS strategy, which helped define the U.S 
U.S. response, President Bush's um, intrepid uh, response to the beginning of the PEPFAR program that has transformed uh, our HIV response internationally, um, as well as the first HIV AIDS and White House conferences and strategy actually that was issued by the Clinton administration. So there has been this thread um, where we've had this bipartisan support around the HIV that has also been helpful for us to getting to the um, in remarkable gains that we've made. There's also the expansion of antiretroviral therapy to low and middle income countries and the fact that COVID-19 vaccines are going to follow suit. Because we have been able to make sure through PEPFAR, through the Global Fund, that antiretroviral therapy is available in low middle, middle income countries. We've seen this decrease in new infections globally. Um, and without the antiretroviral therapy, we would not have seen that decrease. And it's been really heartening to see that we're gonna be following uh, the same suit uh, with providing COVID vaccines now uh, to the rest of the world as well. So I just wanna close with a perspective from Andrew Sullivan, um, who I don't always agree with, but I did find a piece that he wrote on how to survive a plague uh, for Americans generally. And this is for the opioid epidemic, but it really applies for opioids, COVID, as well as HIV. And what he wrote is, and this will change us, it must. All plagues change society um, and change society and culture, reversing some trends while accelerating others. The one thing we know about epidemics is that at some point they will end. The one thing we don't know is who will we be by then? Now, I agree with Andrew that at some point epidemics will end and we know that we're going to end HIV. Where I disagree though, is that we know exactly who we are. We're the same community that fearlessly faced death um, and for many years before there were therapies that were available. We're the same community that built durable local, federal, as well as international responses to HIV. We're the same community that has set the standard for a pandemic response. And we're also the same community that will end HIV. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. And I look forward to working with each of you to ending HIV. I look forward to working with the White House, HHS and others. Um, it's really this partnership that we've had that has been so unique for all of us to be able to actually get to the point where we can end HIV. Thank you so much, Greg, for that wonderful and insightful presentation. Uh, and a tremendous, a tremendous amount of thanks to all of our speakers, Lois and Jen and Harold and Anjali. Um, really for helping us, HHS and the State Department, continue its commemoration of the 40th anniversary of HIV. Hopefully you have heard loud and clear that the U.S. government is committed to ending HIV in the U.S. and around the world. But we know the U.S. cannot end the HIV epidemic alone. We must re-engage with and continuing to empower our partners around the world, including UNAIDS, the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria, World Health Organization, private and public sector institutions, other governments, civil society, and people with, a with HIV to support their critical contributions to the HIV response, ensure optimal coordination, and strengthen global health security and pandemic preparedness. In the U.S., the federal government continues to strengthen our relationship with community-based organizations, networks of people with HIV, clinicians and researchers, state and local governments, to continue to be innovative in our response to HIV, to address individual, community, and structural factors and inequities that contribute to the spread of HIV, such as stigma, barriers to access care, transportation, affordable housing, and other social determinants of health. For more information about topics covered today in today's webinar, please visit hiv.gov and www.state.gov backward slash PEPFAR backward slash. We thank you again for your time and we really appreciate all the, the tremendous work that all of us are, are, are doing in this fight in HIV. Have a good day.